This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. If you've not yet seen the Zuckerberg virtual reality garden of followers picture, and let me define that a little more clearly, Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Facebook, the man who will always be the owner of Facebook, the man that will always have all voting control over Facebook until the day he dies. And then after, quite amazing, actually, his family will control Facebook forever. A great picture of him walking down the aisle in an army, literally an army of people sitting in their chairs while he's walking. An army of people sitting in their chairs wearing their virtual reality helmets, hooked up the laptop sitting on their lap. A truly frightening Orwellian picture. I like to think that Mark Zuckerberg is not a bad guy, but boy, does he have a lot of power. And perhaps if I was in his shoes, I would want armies of dudes hooked up to virtual reality helmets, plugged into their laptop, all connected through Facebook, with their credit cards and PayPal accounts wide open to pass along money for whatever bit of fun will be delivered across that helmet. And as a side note, I've seen it multiple times now in the last few weeks. These virtual reality helmets, first and foremost, are going to deliver sex. Or at least a very bizarre version of independent sex while you wear a helmet connected to pictures that will be designed to make you think they are real. The idea of real anymore really won't be important. Just go straight for the fake stuff. What in blazes could this have to do with investing? Well, of course, from a fundamental perspective, if Mark Zuckerberg can sell tons and tons of these virtual reality helmets, well, his share price will probably go in that direction. Now, of course, it's impossible to predict these things, but look, if you make a lot of money, eventually your share price will go up. But what struck me about the helmet picture, Mark Zuckerberg just strolling down the aisle with a big grin on his face and all these dudes wearing helmets. Bubbles. The epitome of a bubble. Everyone doing the same thing. Everyone looking at the same information. Everyone getting the same cues the same triggers. You can't help but have a one-sided trade, a one-sided direction. And if everyone is hooked up to the matrix, so to speak, and boy, did that picture really give off the matrix feel. And for those of you that don't recall, the late 1990s, I believe it was, the red pill, the blue pill, which are you going to take? How far down the rabbit hole will you go to understand how the system really works? But this is all about masses, masses of people organized in one direction. It will never last. And I'm talking about the market move. Because ultimately, if everyone is hooked up to these VR helmets, It's going to be about markets and market moves, guaranteed. Honestly, I can't even imagine where this is all going to go if people give up their real life to become some type of avatar in the Zuckerberg world. He won't be the only one. There'll be many that will go down this direction. But I bring up this story, and I hope you can see the connection to speculative follies, bubbles. Because there's a great excerpt that I'm going to read from. It's actually an excerpt from The Pit 
The Pendulum, A Menagerie of Speculative Follies. Written by David Harding and James Holmes. David Harding of Winton Capital fame. One of the best trend-following traders alive. Some of the greatest trend-following performance of the last three to four decades. What Harding has done in this excerpt is break down in a very historical narrative with great color, literally great color. And this PDF document is easily found. I saw it posted online. It's easily found and it gives a great understanding over the centuries about how people behave. And we always get excited about something new. And the something new always results in unsustainable moves that crater, that crash. And the trick is, how do you time these bubbles? How do you bet within these bubbles? How do you know it's too much and the game is over? Again, this PDF that I'm going to read from is 44 pages, but I'm going to read one excerpt, one story, titled, Basking in an Indian Summer, the Bombay Share Mania, 1865. And it leads with a summary. After disruptions to Confederate cotton exports during the American Civil War, and it resulted in sky-high prices for Indian cotton and large inflows of silver into Bombay. This Argent Mana encouraged a speculative mania in banks, financial associations, and land reclamation companies, which imploded when American cotton came back on tap. The Union's blockade of Confederate cotton exports in 1862 sent world cotton prices shooting up as English textile mills desperately sought new sources. This resulted in immense profits for Bombay's cotton merchants and massive silver inflows into Bombay. Even the poorer inhabitants of the city joined in the bonanza, tearing up their old mattresses to extract the cotton stuffing. For King Cotton was the great deity at whose shrine the merchant and the trader, the rich and the poor, high and low, master and servant, all paid puha. By mid-1863, Bombay had received so much silver that peasants, unable to conceal or use or comprehend the sudden influx of wealth, jumped from tireless cartwheels of solid wood to wheels bound with silver tires. These windfall gains resulted in a spate of new company projections. First, several banks were established. Then came a land reclamation company which aimed to redevelop a boggy area on Bombay's outskirts known as Back Bay. Its 1,000 pound shares were immediately forced up to 3,500 pounds. Next, was a financial association, which was formed to assist new schemes and advance money on shares. Its shares went up to a 90% premium. The success of these schemes touched off a mad hurly-burly of speculation and commercial expansion. Companies were started for every imaginable purpose. Banks and financial associations, land reclamation, trading, cotton cleaning, pressing, and spinning companies, coffee companies, shipping and steamer companies, hotel companies, library stable companies, and companies for making bricks and tiles. Many of these companies were highly dubious and of little intrinsic worth, but this did not seem to concern most investors. People were eager only to pursue the will-o'-wisp of a handsome fortune. They were infatuated enough to believe that thousands could be made with the rapidity of the profits guard. Investors were much more concerned with short-term capital gains than steady dividends and long-term potential. Men went mad with the lust of premiums, felt as the first California diggers did when it seemed that a week's exertion could give them the ease for life. As if even the time for food and sleep were stolen from them by hostile powers. What puerility to wait for dividends when one rise in the shares themselves meant gains beyond merchants' dreams. Another contemporary puts it even more colorfully. The ignorant pack of geese and the share bazaars, the vulgar folk in search of fortune, was so tempted by the bait of the dividend that it madly went on buying shares and paying the call. Predictably, Many of the geese became ensnared in swindles and quack ventures and were promptly plucked 
by Bombay's share kings, the promoters and speculators behind the new ventures. Yet investors continued to offer themselves up, believing there was a patent eureka to be worked, and were beguiled by the shares king's claims of achieving miracles in alchemy or the science of converting rubbish into gold. Few could resist the shares wheedling. Come one, come all, ye who would desire to enrich yourselves beyond the dreams of avarice. There is but one royal road to acquire gold, and we are its patentees. In this way, crowds after crowds would gather around them and go home rejoicing for the time, believing at last the key to riches was found. And in return, the share kings exacted unlimited sacrifice and incense at the foot of their golden throne from thousands of their blind votaries. Now you probably see where this is going. None of these bubbles last. And lo and behold, America comes back into the story. Continuing. Then catastrophe struck. In June 1865, the American Civil War ended, causing cotton prices in Liverpool to slump. This caught out India's exporters, who, expecting the high prices to continue, had already drawn against the drafts on their cotton shipments. Consequently, they were sent heavy redrafts from England, putting many out of business. Investors were likewise wrong-footed. Many had bought their shares as time bargains for delivery on the 1st of July, allowing them to pay huge premiums without putting any money down. After the cotton shock, however, it soon became clear that they would not be able to meet their obligations and that the vast structure of speculation had been built on sand. All share prices began to decline, putting the banks and financial associations which had lent against these securities under increasing pressure. Finally, the day of reckoning came, and on the 1st of July, panic swooped down upon Bombay, talons fully extended. It was indeed a black day. Even nature seemed to have assisted in heightening the gloom of depression, which hung all over the city like a vast funeral pall. People conversed in whispers in the streets with woebegotten looks, as if to say, we shall yet see what we shall see. There was no saying then what tomorrow might bring forth, who might or might not fail. The Bombay commercial world was completely out of joint. The names of the best and the highest in the world were not deemed safe from the prevailing peril. It came with all the characteristic suddenness and swiftness and all of the titanic force and velocity of the avalanche, sweeping away in its fatal course many an old institution and mercantile firm and burying the hundreds of mushroom monetary organizations which had enjoyed an ephemeral sunshine a while. It also engulfed thousands of people, rich and poor alike, in distress and misery from which but a fraction had been known to recover. There could not have been a more complete wreckage of capital and credit than the one which overtook Bombay at the very heel of the close of the American Civil War. A quick interjection. I am reading but one of these speculative follies that David Harding and his associate have written about. And it's just such a great reminder. History repeats, and it repeats, and it repeats. And if it looks like there's a golden goose with a short, gray-haired, older lady who sits in front of United States congressional hearings and tells everyone it will be okay and tells everyone it's just a matter of time until she can find the legal authority to throw negative interest rates upon the American public. Well, we can all just keep imagining that that will end in a positive way. Back to the article. Yet despite the exquisite agony suffered by Bombay that summer, the memory of the whole affair was soon sunk into oblivion. Half a century later, a veteran of the share mania wrote, an obelisk or a pillar to commemorate the financial folly of Bombay would not have been a bad idea. It might have adorned the tale of those erratic days and pointed a moral for future generations of men in search of wealth at the shortest notice. No, not a trace is left. 
Not even the vad tree is to be seen as the trysting place, which offered a grateful shade in the midday sun to quite a swarm of brokers panting and perspiring. All has vanished like a baseless fabric of a vision, leaving not a vestige behind. He ends his memoirs on the following poignant note. There have been commercial panics elsewhere, but probably no community ever went so entirely mad as Bombay did in 1864. It is pitiful to think of the blighted careers, the lives once full of promise, but now condemned to a hopeless and degrading bondage, which must date their ruin from the fatal year 1865. Seventy millions came into Bombay, and what became of it? Question mark. The Bombay share mania may have bitten the dust, but from that dust sprang the Bombay Stock Exchange. And despite the enormous waste involved, Bombay's land reclamation companies made barren waste habitable. It's a fascinating story. Like so many of the speculative follies, they all go down the same path. The players involved look the same, they act the same, they talk the same. The only thing that's different are the names. It's always a new technology. It's always an innovation. And you must get in on it now or you will miss it. P.T. Barnum 101. But as P.T. Barnum used to say, this way to the egress, this way to the exit. But he had an exit. Most people don't have an exit. Most people just see the fun. They're so excited. They just want to get rich freaking instantly. And some people will. Some people will definitely get rich. Some people will get rich and be pretty damn lucky about it. But that's no matter to you. You have to make good decisions. Just because you can point out somebody that got capital, got money, perhaps undeserving, perhaps not undeserving, it's immaterial to you and your money. You have to make decisions for yourself. You have to make decisions to protect yourself. And whether you're sitting in that Zuckerberg audience with electrodes currently hooked to your head and your eyes and your ears, and I assume those electrodes will eventually hook up to probably somewhere else down in the nether region, I mean, seriously, let's face it, that's where these things are going. Whether the Zuckerberg helmet, the Zuckerberg VR helmet, or Bombay shares post the American Civil War, or the Matrix, you have to be ready. You have to have something that gives you a chance to participate. I'm not saying to steer clear of these bubbles. You can participate. But you have to have a way, a technique, a strategy, a system that tells you when enough is enough without ever really knowing why that move happened. You do that. Life becomes a lot simpler. Your chance for profit becomes a lot greater. Your anxiety level can drop. I'm not sitting here trying to tell you there's some magic elixir, but I know damn well one thing. The directions that David Harding and his firm have gone, the directions that many of his peers have gone over the last many decades, these trend-following directions, and ultimately, when David Harding writes a piece about speculative follies, he's really pointing out, this is how I make my money. He's not saying he has advanced information about what's going to be the next bubble. He's just saying, I know what to do when this happens. 
I know what to do before this happens. I have a strategy. Do you? I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.